One slip was all it took. Once he went underwater, I, I don't think there was any question, you know, that I had to go in and get him. A father risks his life to save his son after a dangerous fall. It's the grace of God that I'm here. A nine-year-old survives a frightening attack by a wild Yellowstone bison. And why people in Scapoos fear their famous 50-foot candle could be the next Oregon icon swept out by development. Tonight on KGW News at 6. Good evening. This is not necessarily a bad problem, but we've heard from viewers confused about getting unexpected checks in the mail. And the notice says they're part of a class action settlement with a popular gas station. KGW investigator Kristen Severance is here to verify whether these checks are legit. There seems to be some confusion about these $92 checks people are getting and if those checks are real. So Sean tweeted us that he received a check and a settlement letter. He Googled it and saw that it was related to the Arco gas station and wanted us to verify it before he deposited the check. So we can verify this is all part of a massive class action lawsuit. According to the suit, millions of Oregonians were overcharged at BP owned Arco and AMPM gas stations between 2011 and 2013. Bank records show more than 2 million customers were charged a 35 cent fee when using their debit card, but the fee was not advertised at the pump. So how many times are we talking? Well, records show that the company charged this 13,000 times a day, even after the lawsuit was filed. The class action was filed against BP in 2011 under Oregon's Unlawful Trade Practices Act. It went to trial in 2014, and after appeals, the verdict against BP was upheld. So what does this mean for you, the consumer? Well, the good news is you will be getting two different checks, each for around $92. What do you do? Nothing. The 1.7 million Oregonians impacted by this have already filled out claim forms. So there's no form to fill out. There's no website to go to. You just wait for your check to arrive and you can deposit it. So we can verify that yes, the BP settlement checks arriving in your mailbox are legitimate. Back to you. I hope I get one. <laughs> We're all box. hoping. If there's something you'd like KGW to verify, just send us an email at verify at kgw.com. Just to know he's my hero and he jumped after me. Shows how much he loves me. Now to his son, grateful for his dad's bravery after he jumped in a rocky waterfall to try and save his life. For the Vancouver family, a relaxing Sunday on the East Fork of the Lewis River took a dangerous turn. Robert Brown jumped into Lucia Falls to rescue his son after he fell in. Today he's bruised and beaten, but both of them are alive. KGW's Morgan Romero is live for us right now at Peace Health Southwest Medical Center where Brown was recovering up until a couple of hours ago. Morgan, quite a story. Yeah, you guys, good news. I found out a little bit ago Robert was released from the trauma unit here and is back home settling in with his family. Looking back on it all, he says he would do it all over again. Meanwhile, his family is so grateful for his bravery and his heroism. It looks calm, doesn't it? Until one little slip. It seemed really fast, like it was like five or ten seconds long, the whole thing. Sends you toppling down these rapids. When I was going down, I tried to grab onto some rocks, but I couldn't because it was covered in moss and algae and stuff. As he started to come near me, then um, it's like, okay, I should just be able to reach out and grab him, but he just kept getting further away. Robert Brown says he realized he had to jump in to rescue his son, Michael. It's a split second decision. Right before this waterfall. Once he went underwater, I, I don't think there was any question, you know, that I had to go in and get him, you know, to do whatever I could to, to save him. There wasn't any question because of his love for his son. But Robert couldn't reach Michael, and they both went over the rocky falls. Robert, head first. His wife Amy, holding their infant, held her breath as she watched from a ledge. I go into kind of like an emergency calm state. Michael swam to shore with just a bruised elbow and headache. The tables could have been turned. He could be like me sitting here. Robert struggled to get out, blood dripping down his face. And his head's hanging down, and I said to someone up there, He's not okay. That, he's not okay. People ran to the lower pool to help him out. 
The Browns say paramedics got there quickly and rushed him to Peace Health Southwest Medical Center. It's the grace of God that I'm here. Robert fractured his neck and damaged ligaments. He also tore his carotid artery. I'm that close from being unconscious underwater, from, you know, death, you know, and who knows what could have happened to him as well. It's an absolute miracle that he made it out and it looks so handsome today. So I will, I will look at those scars proudly knowing that I married the most amazing man. Scars forever showing the power of a father's love for his son. Just to know he's my hero and he jumped after me. I mean, shows how much he loves me. The Browns learned another powerful lesson that day, one they want everyone to hear. Listen, we're not invincible and be very careful playing, hiking, hanging out around water. It's a very powerful force, even if it looks safe. The family set up a GoFundMe to help pay for medical bills they're racking up. We have a link to that in the news link section on KGW.com or on our KGW News app. Guys, back to you. Way to go, Dad. Morgan, thank you. Hopefully he has a speedy recovery. Now to a disturbing story out of Hillsboro. The owner of a boxing academy is facing sex abuse charges. Deputies say this man acted inappropriately with two underage girls, and now they fear that there could be more alleged victims out there. KGW's Mike Benner, live force in Hillsboro with the details. Mike. Well, nobody at Marshall Masters Academy wanted to go on camera. In fact, they said no comment, but the arrest of Kaiwi Amina is certainly top of mind. Late this afternoon, we noticed that both his picture and bio were removed from the Academy website. Now, I want you to take a look at a picture of the 27-year-old Amina. This is his booking photo. He was arrested on two counts of sex abuse in the third degree. Amina owns Marshall Masters Academy in Hillsboro. We're told the victims in this case were students at the Academy. Deputies say in 2017, the two underage girls went to Amina's apartment. Detectives say Amina and another adult gave them alcohol, and Amina proceeded to touch the girls inappropriately. This case sickens even the most seasoned investigators. Take a listen. Coaches are someone that, that kids trust. They, they, they don't think that anything's gonna, anything bad's going to happen with a coach. That's someone that is a leader to you, someone you look up to. So when you hear of something like this, it takes a lot of trust away from a lot of people. Now, the big fear for detectives is that there are more victims who have not yet come forward. You're asked to call the Washington County Sheriff's Office if you have any information about this case. Let's send it back to you. Mike Benner with the latest there. Thank you so much. So after 20 years on the city's waterfront, the rowing and paddling teams at the Portland Boathouse are being forced out. And for the hundred of ki hundreds of kids and athletes who use it, this is, of course, a big blow for them. KGW's Lindsay Nadrich learned why they have to move and what it means for the future of the program. Lindsay. Well, the owner of the property is refusing to continue leasing to the program, so they're now in the process of moving everything to a new site, but it's only temporary. For about 20 years, the Portland Boathouse has been home to competitive rowing teams, dragon boat teams, high school athletes, kids hoping to get college scholarships for rowing, and other community members who just enjoy paddling on the river. Hundreds of people filter in and out of the building constantly, and for many, it feels like home. This boathouse just means a lot to me. I enjoy it, like just walking in here, just like a sense of comfort. It's really fun and it just makes you smile when you walk in. It just really feels like home because you walk in and you just feel like excitement. These student athletes are just a few of many. Disappointed their program is now without a permanent home. I'm sad that it's kind of being taken away. It makes me sad to have like, I've been here quite a while and I've really gotten to grown attached to this place. The owner of the property is refusing to continue leasing to them, even though they offered to pay market rent prices. The owners of the building uh, are in Connecticut and have no idea what this organization is about. It's about the bottom line for them. So Nick Haley coaches the middle and high school rowing programs. He says they've been searching for months for a place to move the rows of boats, indoor exercise equipment and other items. So far, though, they've only been able to find a temporary piece of property to use about a half mile down the road. We're here uh, by the grace of the landowner who is looking to develop the property. We don't know the timeline of that development. Um, he's being extremely generous in letting us camp here. Uh, but, you know, the future is very uncertain in terms of how long we can be here. This is just a piece of land, though. There's no building or dock. So they'll have to build a dock to access the river and store the boats outside. 
which brings up concerns about weather damage and the potential for vandalism. When we were there, we noticed a hole cut in the locked fence and homeless camps on the property. The program isn't giving up, though. They plan to do everything they can to keep it going for the kids who love it. You come in every day and you see these kids and you're like, we can't stop. We got to fight until absolutely every last possibility has been exhausted. They're asking for help finding a new place on the water. So if you know of anything, they'd love to hear about it. They'd also like to stay close to downtown because a lot of the kids and other people use public transit to get there, but they're really open to almost anything at this point. Back to you. All right, Lindsay, thank you. So there have already been more than a thousand fires in Washington this year, despite a wetter than average July. But now we're entering what typically is the hottest and driest time of the year. And a growing number of fires are popping up in the western part of the state, even though the perception may be that most fires happen in central and eastern Washington. Fires in the west may be more rare, but often more devastating because trees that grow there aren't as well adapted to dealing with fires. We have quite the opposite in Oregon. KGW's Devin Haskins joins us now. So it's, it is a little late in the fire season, but these parks are saying that they're going to take some precautions. They have some steps in place. Yeah, and they're banning campfires at all uh, at three campgrounds in the gorge. All three uh, in the gorge east of Multnomah Falls. There's Ainsworth, Memaloose, and Viento. The ban means no open flame campfires or charcoal barbecues. Gas grills and gas lanterns, they're still allowed. In the last 24 hours in Oregon uh, has had 25 new fires totaling 2,500 acres. Now just feet away at Brooke Hancock's site at Ainsworth, a reminder of the Eagle Creek fire. She and her wife are there camping to celebrate a birthday. They had a fire yesterday. Would have loved to have had another one today. It, just, it smells good. You hear it crackling, you see it. It's mesmerizing to watch it. It um, just speaks outdoors. Camping, camping, campfires, and dogs probably is what, you know, camping is all about for us to relax and kind of get off the grid a little bit. I think a lot of us can agree with that. Looking at a 10 year average, Oregon typically, see, typically sees about 132,000 acres burned year to date. Right now, we're less than 4,000. The ban will lift once conditions improve. The fire season usually goes until mid-September.